welcome to the Heretic Mansion podcast. I'm your host, John. Actually, it's actually not John. It's Neos Antrex. What's up, YouTube? And uh, I'm Electro 13X7777. But anyways, um, uh, John's not here. And hey, yeah, yeah, he's not going to be here for a while. I think he's mentioned it before in the previous episodes that he'll be going off to do um, military training. Uh, because he's joining the army, which is a cool thing. I mean, he's kind of going into the IT sector from what I'm hearing. So the the military stuff is just kind of like an add-on, basically. Um, but anyways, uh, just going uh, back on topic, what are we here to talk about, Electra? Uh, so I brought this up to you uh, a little while ago. Uh, the fact that people who are in this community, the Megami Tensei slash Persona uh, community, I guess, uh, tend to play whatever game series they generally like. If they like m mainline SMT, they'll play the mainline SMT games and won't play anything else. Or uh, if they're uh, a lowly Persona boy, uh, they'll just play Persona One, th uh, uh, Persona Three through Five, and they won't touch anything else. Um, but I wanted to uh, basically outline how we can, as a community, uh, branch out from like mainline SMT or Persona to other games that are made by Atlas or other more niche Megami Tensei titles. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about today. All right, this sounds good. Actually, um, I was really interested when you brought up this topic to me beforehand about like the whole, like the difference between mainline SMT and Etrian Odyssey. When you introduced me to Etrian Odyssey three, I saw the differences right away, and I can honestly tell it's it's a whole new world in comparison to what SMT, well, mainline old Tensei type uh, dungeon crawling is it's like it's like pretty much playing a new type of genre essentially yeah uh it's basically and this is an, one of the topics i was gonna get into is uh how you can get into etrian odyssey after playing uh some of the uh mainline titles for megami tensei uh or even like persona if you play persona q uh, you can definitely get into Etrian Odyssey because that was made by the same team and uh, it has very similar mechanics. Uh, basically, Etrian Odyssey is a old school dungeon crawler made to uh, basically replicate the days of like wizardry uh, and uh, old Western RPGs. Um, so it's there is no like hub world it's just you go through dungeons um and while that may just seem uh unappealing to those who have played uh the neo persona games or uh just like smt nocturne or smt4 and four apocalypse where it's more of a 3d um third person view uh if you played um smt1 smt2 uh, the original Megami Tensei titles, uh, if you speak Japanese, uh, SMT if, uh, you'll be completely fine transitioning because it basically does dungeon crawling very, very well. And especially since uh, Strange Dirty Redux was recently released uh, back in May, uh, it, the, the dungeon crawling mechanics are super similar to... Uh, Strange Journey, Strange Journey Redux. It, originally, Strange Journey was made using the engine that uh, did the dungeon crawling for uh, Etrian Odyssey, uh, to what I remember. I'm pretty sure it's the same thing with Strange Journey Redux. But if you enjoyed any of those games, you'll be able to hop right into Etrian Odyssey because it's like the same uh, dungeon crawling spirit uh, in that sense. Yeah, I totally um, get how really similar it is between the two franchises. and But 
the one thing that threw me off as a Megami Tensei fan, I came into this game not knowing certain what the classes were and what team building was until it actually like hit me basically. Um, you can't really go into a game, go into an Etrian Odyssey game, uh, making a mishmash of like a bunch of, you know, like, ran. You don't, you can't mindlessly make a team. Basically, you have to yeah, be stra exactly. strategic on what you're using the team for and for what situation or what purpose. And I kind of noticed that like right away. I was like, you know what, I got to restart this game because I'm not playing it right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's the style of a very old school um, RPG where you kind of have to know what you're doing when you get into it. Um, uh, basically, whenever someone comes up to me or I point so someone towards uh, like Etrian Odyssey 1 or Etrian Odyssey 2, 3, whatever, um, those are the three I've spent the most time playing. Uh, I haven't put much time into Etrian Odyssey 5 yet, um, or I haven't played Etrian Odyssey 4 at all, but I've spent a lot of time playing uh, EO 1 through 3. And when I point them toward those games, I generally uh, give people some guidance as far as team building, because uh, if you don't build uh, your team well, or you choose classes that don't really uh, complement each other, it's going to be a very, very difficult time getting through the dungeons. Because uh, once you get in Natrian Odyssey, like the first floor, usually it's okay. Uh, maybe with the exception of Etrian Odyssey 3, where basically if you're on some portions of the first uh, floor, uh, some areas in that floor, uh, you'll get great links encounters and just get uh, BTFO'd immediately. Uh, but usually once you hit the second floor of any Etrian Odyssey game, that's when shit kind of gets real, uh, and encounters start to, like, really damage you, and if you don't know what you're doing, it's very, very arduous, yeah. uh, to get over, get around that, and it's not like you can just kind of, like in Megami Tensei, you can just fuse demons and then, uh, basically throw shit at a wall and see what sticks, and eventually you'll get a good demon out of that. Uh, Etrian Odyssey, you need to have a, a focus on what you're doing from the very beginning. You need to kind of know what you're doing. So it's it's not very uh, beginner friendly, but if you have a little bit of guidance, uh, you can get a hang of it pretty quickly. And uh, the skills that uh, classes get uh, can really help you. You uh, Basically in every game, every class has uh, a different skill tree. And you, for every level you get, you start with three uh, skill points. And every level after that, you get a single skill point to allocate into that skill tree. Uh, and there are some, like, ridiculously overpowered skills, um, especially in the earlier games. Like, uh, Hexer in EO1 and EO2 get, like, some rid ridiculous skills. Uh, Lanchnet uh, gets all slash and... Everyone who plays uh, EO1 always has uh, one of those on their team, and uh, All Slash becomes a very, very uh, powerful move, and you get it relatively early. Uh, and every, pretty much every Etrian Odyssey game has a class where you can rely on some heavy damage dealing physical skill or um, some other skill that can uh, help you in any other way. Um, and an, another thing I was going to talk about earlier was how Etrian Odyssey kind of has similar uh, themes. And I'll get back in, into classes and talk about subclassing in Etrian Odyssey in a little bit. But uh, Etrian Odyssey tends to have kind of similar themes to uh, SMT, but not in like the uh, sense where you basically make choices all the time because uh etrian odyssey at the uh the very beginning doesn't seem like it has much of a story at all you kind of just make it up as you go you have uh your party of uh five classes that you've made and you just go through the dungeons but uh 
as the plot kind of unfolds in each game, you get to see um, uh, similar themes to say Strange Journey, where uh, uh, the loss of humanity is a big uh, uh, topic discussed in the games, um, and how that affects human characters as they transition to uh, be non-human. Um, and there is decision making in the games, uh, more so in Etrian Odyssey 3, which uh, similar to most Megami Tensei titles has multiple endings. And uh, it's my favorite game in the series, but uh, I digress. It's, uh, it has those mechanics uh, that you can kind of translate from uh, mainline Megami Tensei, some Persona games uh, in that sense. Just wanted to add that in mm. to uh, get a better understanding of the core themes of the game. Yeah, um, essentially, like, for Etrian Odyssey games, uh, primarily, it's not really the main... Uh, sorry, the focus is not towards the story itself, because everything... It's more emphasized in gameplay, in a sense, and which I like, because, you know, it's like more of like... Uh, a game that you just want to unwind and just like play you know not really casually but um just kind of for fun if you're into that whole dungeon crawling thing so like if you've played every single megami tensei game and you've loved the whole dungeon crawling aspect of it well there's more you have extra odyssey and you can pretty much dungeon crawl for days or endlessly if you wanted to mm -hmm. yeah uh and a, a big thing about Etrian Odyssey is something that we haven't touched on yet, is the cartography aspect. Mm -hmm. In Etrian Odyssey, uh, similar to Strange Journey, how there's a map on the bottom screen, uh, Etrian Odyssey, they don't give you a map, but they give you an area for you to draw a map. So as you explore the dungeons, uh, the, with the exception of the first mission in every game, which is to... Uh, make a map of the first floor um and there's an exception in etrian odyssey one where in the third stratum uh there's a mission to map two floors there but that's the only other uh mapping quest in the series they're all usually relegated to the first floor um so it um basically makes you make your own map which i think is really cool it may be uh, a bit off-putting to those who've never really experienced the mechanic before, but after uh, doing the first mission, it gets you right into the groove of uh, basically drawing maps as you go. Uh, and it's very convenient since uh, it's since it's on the bottom screen, as you're uh, dungeon crawling with the D-pad, you uh, typically auto map will already be on, so you can see your path and then uh, basically draw the outlines or um, you can paint in specific traps or uh, um, there's a ton of uh, little custom icons that you can use to show where treasure chests are uh, where uh, um, different terrain uh, is it's very useful and uh, if it's not your uh, like thing then it's completely optional for most of the games after the um, so if it's not your cup of tea, you don't have to do it. Uh, you can just have whatever, uh, map is made from the auto mapper and, uh, uh you'll be fine. Yeah. So it's a, it's a feature. If you want to use it, uh, you're more than welcome to. It's actually really fun after a little bit, but if you, if it's not your, uh, your thing, you don't have to bother with it. Um, but it is very useful to get through the dungeon. Yeah, it, I, I'd say it's pretty useful in my opinion because when playing through Etrian Odyssey 3, I kind of like... Because even though the auto map is on, you kind of you have to draw out the outlines and you have to draw out the certain locations of the staircases and stuff. So I think essentially um, you at least do that much in a sense. Like, okay... You already have the path. Why uh, drop down the staircases so you know where to go later on if you need to warp back to the uh, guild or whatever to 
restock on some items or let's say maybe heal or switch out your party members because there's obviously going to be a time and place where you're going to need to locate something and you might get lost and you might say oh shit i should have like you know put down like a icon there or oh shit i should have uh drew out this thing so i actually knew the layout and how to go about the rest of the stratum or the um the floor basically Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, when we say stratum, so uh, a stratum in most of the games are uh, a collection of five floors, and there's usually uh, five stratums for the uh, each game for the like the main story. And then once you beat the game, uh, you're rewarded with an extra stratum with a super boss. Uh, and they're usually five floors. In Etrian Odyssey three. It changes all the uh, stratums except for the six stratum to be four floors. But a uh, general sense of the game is there's 30 floors uh, to travel. You're either going down or up. Uh, depends on what uh, what game you're playing. Um, and uh, it's there. The dungeons are very large, but they're I wouldn't say they're as like annoying to travel through as like say Sector E uh, in um, Strange Journey, uh, or even Sector G, uh, where there's a ton of warp tiles that you don't know where they're going, and that's just a big fiasco, that, that part of the game. But um, the dungeons aren't as annoying as that at all. Uh, they end up being quite fun. Like, some of my uh, favorite dungeons are, uh, like, in any dungeon crawling game are found in Etrian Odyssey. They're just really cool. Um, there's a ton of interesting mechanics that, uh, that they throw in for every stratum, and they're usually quite different for each game. So if you saw one mechanic in uh, one game, you're not necessarily going to see that again. You'll probably see it, uh, see different mechanics for each stratum in every other game. So uh, it's very uh, versatile and uh, um, I guess uh... so pretty much what you're saying is each and every single Etrian Odyssey game has its own flavor when it comes to mechanics right exactly and also all of the dungeons are uh, well detailed and I mean uh, the first three games are on the DS so it had some graphical limitations uh, most of the backgrounds are sprites but still the uh, uh, stratums are all well detailed and uh, pretty to look at and you'll be in the dungeons a long time because it's a very grindy game I don't think we brought that up yet. It's like yeah, if you're not grindy. grinding you're going to get pretty much curb stomped It's uh, very difficult. Yeah, I'd say it's the series is generally speaking can be uh, As hard if not harder than like mainline Megami yeah. Tensei. Megami Tensei Hell. It, sorry, sorry, Megami Tensei Hell. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking, uh, if you're not playing, um, if you're playing Etrian Odyssey like a Megami Tensei game, then you're in for shit basically because you're gonna get your shit kicked in. Like, that Etrian Odyssey is like a whole new style of dungeon crawling and. It, it's it has its own like attitude so you pretty much have to adapt and actually get used to it in order to really play the game because i and trust me when i first got into etrian odyssey i started playing etrian odyssey one first i got my shit kicked in like i mean the game was already hard as is because mo generally i think most eo fans say that the first game is hard as balls which is why yeah, you should play difficult. untold yeah. right um but yeah like if you do not know what you're doing you're you're fucked like you just like mm. and don't don't get like don't get me wrong or don't feel bad to use um a guide because a guide is a guide can be the game changer for you if you need to resort to using a guide go right a right ahead like nobody there's nobody who's gonna actually like judge you for doing that unless it goes against your morals and like it, at that point i'd say if you're not enjoying etrian odyssey um use a guide because yeah. then from the guide you will learn how to play every other um etrian odyssey game 
per se. I, I, I don't know for a fact that it will, everything that says, uh, everything that's in the EO3 guide will, tra uh, will help you in EO4. But I'm just saying the types of habits that you develop uh, or gain from EO3 that you could probably transition into uh, EO4, EO5, or maybe the older games. So Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd agree with that point. Um, my backing with the series, obviously, is more so uh, in tune with the DS titles, uh, um, and I haven't had much experience with the 3DS titles, although I'm going to, uh, since uh, Etrian Odyssey Cross uh, is coming out in Japan, less than a month i'm probably going to play that in japanese and try to uh spread the word about it because it, i'm very excited for that so basically uh, uh i'll digress here for a little uh, second here um etrian odyssey cross is bringing a ton of features from the previous games and uh compiling them all into one game and bringing a ton of stratums from the old games and putting them into one game as well as classes and all that jazz it's uh it looks really cool and uh we'll probably talk about that at a later date but uh this is the uh heretic mansion podcast not the etrian odyssey podcast but um well hey it's an atlas title so i i'm not i'm not complaining really <laughs> yeah exactly um so you were just talking about um i guess translating uh skills you have uh I guess, gotten in a specific Etrian Odyssey game and translating those uh, that knowledge to other Etrian Odyssey games. And uh, from my experience, uh, you can. Um, while there are ton tons of gameplay differences in each game, every game has its own little uh, special battle uh, like um, thing. Like, I don't know how to exactly phrase it, but there are different battle mechanics in every game. So you have your team of five, uh, five characters that you've made, um, and uh, there will be a specific mechanic for each game. So Etrian Odyssey 1 has the boost system, uh, EO2 has the force mechanic, and uh, Etrian Odyssey 3 has a limit system. I forget what 4 is, is but uh, 5 has the union uh, system. And they're all like pretty varied. The force uh, skills and uh, limit uh, mechanic, uh, those are very similar, except for force skills are a skill based on your class and limits are equipable attacks that you assign to multiple party members. Uh, but uh, if you have uh, knowledge of the battle system, from one game, you can uh, come into another game and uh, by looking through the classes, you can build a, a competent party without like being told what the uh, best classes are. You can generally figure it out yourself uh, and then go through the skill tree and find uh, moves and skills that will help uh, your team out as a, as a whole. So I'd say yeah, you can definitely translate those skills and be fine And after you've played one game. Um, and I guess this will bring us into more so about the character creation and uh, continue on that. Um, so in the first two games, basically you just create your characters and then that's it. You can rest them for five... Lo so basically there's a rest mechanic uh, where you can de-level your character by five levels and then reset their skill tree so if you and then keep all your skill points that you've uh earned by leveling up the entire game and then you can just reallocate those skill points if you need to do that and that's the same in every game every etrian odyssey game has that mechanic uh as well as a retiring mechanic which you can retire uh, a member of your party or your guild, uh, and that'll reset their uh, their class, their level, and whatever skills they had. And it, depending on the level of the uh, character, uh, it'll give them bonus stats uh, 
So say you retire some uh, a character at like level 30, I believe if you do that, that um, uh, you'll gain an extra stat point in every stat, and you can change their class to anything you want, but they'll be at level one. And that's uh, that goes for the whole series. Oh, uh, um, just just to sorry to butt in for a second. So when you were talking about re like like resetting their classes and stuff, so from the previous class, um, when you change them into a new class, will you be able to use the, uh, this? the skill points from the previous class into this class even though it's at level one yeah you retain all your skill points okay um, all right. um and you also something i didn't mention you get based on your level you also get some bonus skill okay. um so uh when you're re-leveling up uh in either the same class i don't although that's kind of unless you're at level 70 or level 99 there's no reason to uh retire into the same class uh if you're retiring you want to like obviously you want to change that class because it's not working for you and uh you can get a bonus out of just retiring rather than uh creating a whole new character um so it, there's some level of strategy with resting and retiring um uh, and uh, it's very useful in that fact. Uh, I rarely use retiring when I'm playing uh, Etrian Odyssey games unless uh, I want to get to the max level in origin the DS releases for EO1 or EO2. Because in those games, you have a hard level cap at level 70, and you can only get to level 99 by getting to level 70, retiring, getting to level 71, then retiring and continuing to do that until uh, level uh, 99. But they fix that in uh, Etrian Odyssey 3 and uh, uh, every game after that where you just have to fight three super bosses to be able to raise the level cap to 99. Uh, and that goes for the remix as well. So you don't have to worry about that if you're playing uh, Untold or Untold 2 if you want to experience the original games. Um, but Starting in Etrian Odyssey 3, uh, the class system became a bit more robust because it added the subclassing system. And this continued in uh, into EO4. I think EO5 has a different mechanic where you can change your character's race. Uh, I don't exactly know what, uh, if there's subclassing in that game. I haven't gotten too far into it, but... Uh, I know EO3 and EO4 have the subclassing system where you can basically have your main class that you make at the beginning or uh, that you create uh, at the Explorer's Guild. And then you can assign a subclass, which... Uh, so say I've got uh, a Gladiator in Etrian Odyssey 3, and I want to also be able to have the skills of a... Um, um, uh, a ninja, uh, so I can have uh, those skills. Uh, yeah. You're allowed to do that, and it gives you uh, five bonus skill points to allocate uh, just based on subclassing. And you don't get this until a little, little bit further into the games, but uh, it allows for a, a very diverse uh, st uh, set of strategies for tackling the battle system. Um, and it absolutely breaks EO3. EO3, uh, from the start of the game, is one of the hardest Etrian Odyssey games, but if you know how to abuse the subclassing mechanic, you can absolutely just destroy the game and uh, make it a cinch to beat. It's, uh, it's really interesting, but it does make the game really easy if you know what you're doing. Um, but if you don't, then subclassing still gives you a ton of options as far as fighting bosses and uh, getting through the game without subclassing is uh, a very difficult uh, task to do. Um, I'd, if you're playing Etrian Odyssey 3, you need to be doing subclassing if you want to be able to finish the game, pretty much. Uh, but um, I guess we can get on to the battle system uh, now. Yeah, the, the battle system... 
as soon as I was like greeted to it, I was like, okay, yeah, this is this, I feel at home with this. However, what I didn't realize, and I was dumb when like playing this, uh, I went into a battle thinking that okay, I already probably have skills, and I didn't realize that the skills unlock when you actually input like the skill points that you have when you first like create your character or you create the the you know the unit basically to, yeah. to have on your team and it was something where it's like oh shit i should have realized that from the start and you have three so it's like you kind of have to choose which ones that you will for for each situation and uh as soon as you mentioned the whole farmer build uh, or the farmer team basically I kind of started using that as an advantage to where I could get more skill points onto certain uh, existing units that um, that didn't have enough exp to actually get a certain skill so if I really wanted to unlock a powerful or broken skill really early I just set up a bunch of farmers plus one and then have the skill what was it called I don't know. It doubles a lot of EXP basically. So you, you the EXP Earth's bounty. Right? Yeah, Earth's uh, bounty. Yeah. Um, um, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So essentially, I did that, and I just compiled a bunch of farmers to do that, and I compiled another set to do harvesting, basically, where you can go to spots on the map and dig up a lot of. Um, uh, rare items to sell in the shop and then actually buy armor or whatever you need for your stuff so all in all like there's a lot of ways or a lot of workarounds to actually go about in Etrian Odyssey which I was really surprised because this is completely new to me as someone who's been into SMT a lot yeah uh, and to branch off of that for a quick second um, what Ant was talking about with the uh, the uh farmer party uh farmer is a, a class in etran obviously three that can be really abused for uh uh experience grinding but in in all of the games uh you have you can have your main party but uh of five characters but you are allowed to have a whole roster in your guild of 30 members so the game allows you to uh, take advantage of that and have tons of different specialized parties uh, other than your uh, main five. So if you need to go uh, um, harvest materials, which is a big thing, that's how you get money, is selling the uh, materials you get off of encounters and uh, specific harvesting points. Uh, you can, in all of the games, you can create a party that's just built for... Uh, um, for helping get experience or uh, harvesting materials. And in Etrian Odyssey 3, uh, especially with the farmer class, they're great for harvesting uh, uh, materials. Um, there's a skill. Well, every class has a set of skills that every class inherits, and uh, some of those are chopping uh, in certain games, fishing, uh, taking, and... Uh, um, just uh, uh like picking uh like flowers and stuff and you can go and sell that and that's your main uh method of getting uh uh money in the game uh to go buy more uh equipment for your main party so the game makes you take advantage of your ability to make a ton of different teams and if you can do that optimally then it, you'll be set for the game as far as money goes. Um, in the uh, first two games, uh, money's very sparse and uh, equipment is pretty expensive, but I think EO3 and onward, uh, generally speaking, uh, money isn't too much of a big thing to worry about. Uh, and as long as you have like a party going out and getting materials for your team, uh, for your guild, uh, you can basically uh, be fine with money for the rest of the game. Um, and I guess now that we've taken that little detour, we can go back to the battle system. Yeah. Uh, which I was trying to talk about, like, 
10 years ago. But um, the battle system in EO, uh, or in EO in general, is you have your party, party of five, um, and you can either have two in the front, three in the back, uh, or three in the front line and two in the back line. And like uh, you would expect, if you're in, if your character's in the back, their melee damage isn't going to do as much as characters in the front. However, they won't take as much damage from uh, enemies as uh, characters in the front would. So uh, it's like your general first-person Dragon Quest-style battles. Um, and depending on the mechanic, the battle mechanic that uh, uh, the game has, if it's the boost system or the force skill system or the limit system or whatever else uh, there is in the series, you are poised to take advantage of whatever that is. And more so on bosses, but um, you can use them as uh, well on regular encounters. But uh, you you get accustomed to the battle system really quickly. It's uh, uh, pretty easy to get a hang of. It's like a very simple battle system. Uh, if you come from mainline Megami Tensei or any of the other spinoffs, you'll be uh, right at home. It's uh, it's an Atlas game. Yeah. Uh, when you were referring to the whole order of like, or how the front and back works, it kind of reminded me of old Shin Megami Tensei where in, in actually the first Megami Tensei game, there's an NPC that actually tells you about... Um, Okay, uh, you guys, oh, sorry, the way you order your demons is very beneficial because, in a sense, whoever's in the front will be taking the most of the damage, whoever's in the back will be taking less damage. So, typically, how they set it up, because if you remember in old Megami Tensei, it's like it's listed, it's not like a separate box, it has like six, six or maybe seven, I can't remember it's, how much. Uh, Yumiko in the back, in the back line. So, yeah, they they have it listed, and pr pretty much you'd list which demons you would want in the front and which you want in the back mm -hmm. or your main character. So when I was playing Megami Tensei One per se, um, I'd bring Nakajima in the front line and then have. So that's mm -hmm. how um, I uh, sorted it out. Yeah, and it, it's the same thing for uh, uh, I. I haven't played MT2, but I am assume it's the same thing there. And also, SMT1 and SMT2 uh, have pretty much the same system, where you have three characters in the front and three characters in the back, uh, and their damage output is based on that. And usually, uh, magic attacks don't uh, get affected by uh, where your character is positioned, so you generally wanted to have your magic... Uh, your mage type demons in the back so they're not taking as much damage and uh they're dealing more damage it's very similar in etrian odyssey where uh you'd want to have your healer and uh whatever black mage of the game there is and uh e whether it's a zodiac or uh in some games it's an alchemist that was the original black mage of the series uh and they'll do their magic attacks there, and their damage output won't be affected. Um, so it's pretty simple. If you've played an RPG where, uh, like, if you played Final Fantasy or anything of the sort, you'll be right at home. Uh, the battle mechanics aren't too complicated. You can pretty much pick them up right as you, uh, at the get-go. Yeah. Um, okay, so that... That's actually nice to hear about the battle system. Um, it's it's honestly crazy how Etrian Odyssey isn't as well known as something like Shin Megami Tensei or Persona in a sense. But I can honestly get the reason why. Because there's a small group of people, even smaller than the SMT community over here uh, for... for in North America, sorry. Um, and it's 
it's this like untapped franchise that not many people know about and it would be really cool to actually bring that to the forefront if there was a switch title and i feel like um once atlas gets her uh once uh smt5 starts rolling out on the switch i feel like if they can do it they could probably make an extra odyssey on the switch as well uh utilizing the touchpad mm, yeah. yeah i mean we'll have to see what they do I, i'm hopeful that the series won't die since this is one of my favorite rpg series yeah in general considering you really got into it recently with uh eo3 and you started speed running it i can understand why you have a lot of lots of love towards the franchise it, itself uh yeah. me personally just coming as a newcomer i feel like when i first tried to play this uh, uh i felt like okay this is not the game for me but as soon as i started playing eo3 and started to learn what each mechanic did I just kind of felt that okay i can play this if i dedicated a lot of fucking time to it yeah and that's what it kind of takes with the series i've been playing etrian odyssey almost as long as i've been playing the uh megami tensei titles i mean i i started with persona 3 and then moved on from there uh to sadly persona 4 and then smt4 and then i got into the older games uh, and uh, a little bit before that, back when I was playing the uh, Neo Persona games, I got into Etrian Odyssey 1, played that. Uh, it was really hard, but I got through it, and uh, it, it was really rewarding at the end because it, it's such a cool game, um, and all of them are they are really cool um, with how you just go through the dungeons at your own pace. Uh, no one's rushing you. It's mm -hmm. just you kind of dungeon crawl uh which you don't really see much these days uh dungeon crawlers have uh uh had a tendency to kind of uh go out of favor with uh, the modern uh i guess game uh gaming atmosphere where yeah. it's more centered towards like skyrims and all that jazz um yeah there's but... there's there's one thing i like to mention um we the, there are certain games that kind of copy that same format of dungeon crawling but it's really geared towards people who are into anime or just into like you know cutesy stuff type of thing like i've seen games like what was that one game conception conception 2 it was also yeah. published by atlas um but they don't actually own that franchise and then <laughs> there was the the recent um the lost story or something i i can't remember the actual game but it it's on the ps4 but the thing is this this dungeon crawler looks really like a cheap knockoff of what old megami tensei is and i've seen people play it um i'm not too sure uh, maybe i should get it uh maybe i should get it um but like at the same time i'm probably not gonna buy it at full price uh and then there's another one i want to bring up called mind zero <laughs> And it's also a dungeon crawler, but it plays more like Persona, if anything. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's just weird how you have these uh, dungeon crawler clones trying to mimic the same things as uh, EO, SMT, or just in general, just a dungeon crawling um, genre itself. And it, the dungeon crawling genre is, it's, it's a, it takes a long time for someone to get used to it. I remember getting into SMT. And then not liking it because, uh, sorry, not liking Strange Journey because I didn't like the way how dungeon crawlers work. And this was me. I was pretty much fresh into like gaming. Like I was a dude who came out of playing Call of Duty and then transi transitioned into playing RPGs. So this was like a whole new genre that opened up for me. And then I played Double Survivor. And after that, I was so used to how it worked that when I tried to go play games like Strange Journey, I was a complete turnoff because, well, I, I don't like the way how it is. The graphics look really boxy. I don't like the whole atmosphere of it. And then after a while, I went back to the game, played it again. I was like, okay, I can get used to this. And honestly, Strange Journey ended up being one of my favorite mainline games. So in a sense, like you just have to put your mind to it what like to play Etrian Odyssey because you may 
have this that same experience firsthand where you don't like it but then when you revisit it a couple years or maybe months after you've initially played it you can actually you know get used to it right yeah exactly i mean i remember when uh they announced persona q and uh that was back like when i was a big persona 3 fan i i love that game to death um and i still do it's a great game but not as much as i used to uh and i saw the cast from persona 3 so i was like wow i'm excited for this game and then i saw oh it's a dungeon crawler and back then that was before i like had played through uh smt1 which is uh my favorite smt game uh much to the chagrin of uh, other yeah. people in the community yeah um, i mean smt1 well, is really good i would say it, it is good if you uh can get into the mechanics and the dungeons there are a lot more bare bones than what you'd expect to see like if you played strange journey or played any of the eo games uh, uh it's a lot less uh i guess varied as yeah. far as aesthetics it's like all the dungeons kind of look the same uh there's like two pallets in the entire game and they fix that with smt2 but i won't go in too far with that but uh if you have qualms with uh just dungeon crawling in general or dungeon crawlers uh etrian odyssey has some of the best level design and uh that i've seen in a very long time as far uh with dungeon crawlers and uh now like if you ask me what my favorite kind of rpg is i'd say it's a dungeon crawling uh uh rpg so i mean i played a lot like uh if you liked what you'd saw if you played dark spire uh which is kind of a little bit more niche of a rpg by atlas uh it's kind of a similar thing it, that the original etrian odyssey games were developed at that time and then strange journey was developed using uh what etrian odyssey had uh put together and um it's kind of grown it's still niche but uh the dungeon crawling in the etrian odyssey series uh is superb if you want like a really fun dungeon crawler and something you can sink hours into like you can just play it forever yeah oh and one more thing before we actually conclude this uh whole discussion um we forgot to mention about how great the music is in oh Etrian yeah Odyssey. yeah yuza kashiro has like written some amazing music for etrian odyssey especially the first three games i'm partial to the fm soundtracks uh uh but the entire series has amazing music and uh like especially EO3, which definitely has the best music in the mm -hmm. series, but they all have fantastic tracks, and you should, if if you don't like the dungeon crawling, then the battle themes will keep you going the entire time, and the and the set pieces uh, that you find with the stratums and the music uh, uh, that plays there, uh, it keeps you going even if you like are not too keen on dungeon crawling. So uh, definitely like. I think I originally played Etrian Odyssey because I heard the music and I liked it that much. So that was like my original reason for playing Etrian Odyssey. So um, trust me, like if, even if you don't like dungeon crawlers, like it, just play the games and listen to the fucking music. It's so good. Yeah, like just hearing the music and the the whole difference between FM and the orchestrated soundtracks. I prefer the FM a lot because. That kind of actually reminds me a lot of old Megami Tensei and how old Megami Tensei games used to sound like, pretty much. And just right, to see yeah. that in a modern uh, day dungeon crawler, it's just kind of like new. It's like it, it's just something that Etrian Odyssey does differently than the other games, basically. Right, and uh, it the FM soundtracks and like the PC ninety eight uh, and PC eighty eight uh, renditions of the music, they all. Uh, culminate into like how Etrian Odyssey is just a huge love letter to the old Western uh, RPGs um, that uh, like where the music was very primitive uh, using very very uh, like old sound font uh, and blaring like MIDI trumpets 
Uh, so, I mean, if you want, like, something that can uh, bring back, I don't know if you ended up playing those games from a long time ago, but uh, it'll bring back uh, memories of that, and it's not dated at all. It feels really good playing, so... Uh, it's something you can hop into, and once you kind of get an understanding of what you're doing, uh, they're a joy to just kind of go through and sink yeah. so much time into. Well, I think that's, I guess, everything that we've covered in this episode, pretty much. I hope from uh, this we could take away is um, we could take away the fact that Etrian Odyssey is something that most uh, fans don't really look into but it's actually a really good uh, franchise if you're into the whole dungeon crawling aspect uh, in general and mm -hmm. I mean I've, I've for sure once I finish Etrian Odyssey 3 uh, I'll be playing the other games because at the end of the day I'm always looking for a new RPG to play whether if it's not SMT or something like it, it's something fresh or something new that I can just bring to the table and say, hey, you know, guys, you should totally try out this game. And every single time I've actually done that, there's always um, a flow of people bandwagoning, okay, yeah, maybe I should try this out because Neos keeps talking about it. Um, it's just be more, I guess, for the, the entire community as a whole, uh, we need to kind of be more open to trying uh, different games. Like, I know a t there's a ton of mainline elitists who will only play uh, Persona 1 and 2 and uh, SMT 1 through 4, and they won't touch any other game. And it's the same thing with the Neo Persona fandom, where it's either you play 3 through 5, or you only play 4 and 5, or you only play 5. I know that's a the new thing is you only play five but mm -hmm. uh just be more open to different atlas games because uh there's a atlas has released an ungodly amount of games in such a short period of time since their inception so uh there's a ton to choose from and uh, a lot of gems that people don't really uh, uh go to as much yeah for sure like you, you'll never know until you try type of thing exactly mm -hmm. All right. Well, glad you guys could uh, tune into this episode. Uh, since John is not here, I'm going to be doing most of the episodes from uh, onwards until he comes back. But in any case, you guys have a good one, and I'll see you in the next one.